My name is Neil Cadd. I'm a senior lecturer in molecular biophysics at the School of Biosciences here in the University of Kent. And today I'm going to be talking to you about tiny machines with big ideas. I want to convince you today that we are full of miniature robots. Miniature robots are very cool, and actually studying miniature robots is super cool. And this is what we do in my lab. But more importantly, Actually, studying miniature robots is very, very important because it really gives us the opportunity to study the world around us. Now, what are miniature robots? Well, miniature robots are enzymes. Uh, these are biocatalysts. They make biological processes go faster. Now, I have an example here of hydrogen peroxide being broken down into oxygen and water. Now, if I were to take just a tub of um, hydrogen peroxide and leave that on a shelf, you'd get very little oxygen and water being produced. It's a very slow reaction. So what you need to do is add a catalyst. Now in our livers, we possess an enzyme called catalase. This is one of the most efficient enzymes uh, known to man. And if we were to add catalase to hydrogen peroxide, the hydrogen peroxide would fizz up. You'd get a huge number of bubbles, a massive uh, production of both uh, oxygen heat and water. This reaction is so vigorous, in fact, that the Germans used a similar process, not catalase but permanganate, um, to power their V1 and V2 rockets in the Second World War. Now, miniature robots do more than just break down hydrogen peroxide. They break down the food that we eat. So when, for example, you take a bite into an apple, that apple is then broken down very rapidly by enzymes, both in your mouth and in your stomach. And all of the important nutrients are stripped from the apple. Those nutrients, including carbohydrates, can be used to generate ATP, which is a power molecule used by the body. In addition, proteins are broken down into their basic building blocks. Now, proteins are, uh, go on to form enzymes, and enzymes are our miniature robots. So essentially, the miniature robots within the apple are broken down to fundamental components and then you can reassemble them or your body can reassemble them into the mini robots they need. Now as an example, I'm going to focus on muscle for a second. Muscle is full of miniature robots. And these miniature robots use the energy molecules from human eating, from human combustion, to generate force and motion. To complete the circle here, if we were to then eat muscle, now burgers are made from muscle, we'll find that very tasty. But what that enables us to do is break down those miniature robots and then reassemble them into the forms that we need. And the robots that are, exist in muscle, the proteins that exist in muscle, are called myosin and actin. Those are the primary proteins that you eat when you eat a burger. Now, myosin and actin in muscle exist in fibres. So if I or if you imagine that my hand here is myosin, each one of my fingers is a filament of myosin, and my other hand is actin, it has a number of filaments of actin. In muscle, they interdigitate, and when you add ATP, they slide over each other and contract. And this contraction shortens a muscle, and that's why when you contract your muscle, your muscle bulges because there is more protein mass in a smaller area. Now, got an animation that's slightly better than my fingers for you to look at. So here we have uh, myosin shown in blue and we have actin in red. Now when you add ATP, the myosin filaments move over the actin filaments and that leads to the contraction of muscle. Now each one of these myosin filaments is comprised of a huge number of individual myosin heads and these individual myosin heads are tiny little motors that move over the actin. And in order to be able to lift large weights, you need to have trillions and trillions of these molecules working together. So in the gym, I can bench 300 kilos. In order to do that, I need to take individual myosin molecules and get them to work together to be able to lift that large weight. And so if I can lift that huge weight, let's ask the question, how much weight can an individual myosin molecule lift. And how do we study that in the lab? Well, what we do is we borrow from the realms of science fiction. In fact, Star Trek. We take tractor beams from Star Trek and we use those to manipulate individual molecules within the lab. 
So in this uh, slide here, you can see that I've uh, got an image of a focused laser beam, and there's a tiny bead uh, whipping around there, and it bumps into the laser beam and gets sucked towards its center. The laser beam is effectively a tra uh, tractor beam. And the bead is so small that you need 60 of them to make up the width of a human hair. It's a really small bead. Now, how does that allow us to manipulate single molecules? Well, what we can then do is we can take the laser trap and we can move that laser trap around. And as we move that laser trap around, that moves the bead around. And this gives us the ability to then go on to manipulate single molecules. So in this animation here, at the top, you can see two of these laser trap beads. And to one of these laser trap beads, there is an actin filament attached, a single molecule of actin. And what I'm going to show you is that we're going to grab hold of the other side of the actin filament and then pull that actin filament taut. And that's what we do in this video. So you can see here that there's the actin filament attached to the right-hand bead, and we're trying to manipulate the flow cell, so this is all done in liquid, to try and push the, left, uh, the actin to touch the left bead. And here we've just managed it, and I'm going to move the left bead to the left, and as I do so, that pulls that actin filament taut. So how do we use that to then apply loads to motors? What we do is we can then take that actin filament that's trapped between two beads and bring that down to a surface of myosin molecules. And when we bring that down to a surface of myosin molecules, the myosin molecules grab hold of that actin and start to pull on it. Now, that pull is resisted by our tractor beam. And what we can do is we can change the power of that tractor beam. And as we change the power of that tractor beam, that increases the load the myosins are working against and they slow down. Guess what? If I were to go running around a track, put weights on my back of increasing size, I would slow down. And I would slow down following exactly the same relationship as that myosin, telling us that our ability to resist load is encoded in those molecules, in just the myosin and the actin themselves. So what? Well, if we can understand how myosin works, if we can understand how muscle works, then we can understand how this system could work when things go wrong. So some of you may remember that Fabrice Mwamba, a footballer playing for Bolton Wanderers, collapsed on a, uh, uh, during a game. And he was fortunately brought back to life through cardiac massage. And uh, what happened to Fabrice was he had sudden cardiac arrest due to a mutation in his um, heart muscle and this disease is called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And one in 500 of us possess a mutation that could cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This disease is, in fact, the leading cause of death in young athletes. So if we can understand how normal muscle works, and we can understand then how disease muscle works, maybe we can start to develop treatments to be able to overcome this particularly unpleasant disease. But the story of mini robots does not end at myosin and actin. Mini robots exist everywhere. These enzymes exist everywhere throughout our biology. Now, what caused that mutation that led to the familiar, familial hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Well, DNA damaged it. Now, our DNA is constantly assaulted by agents that seek to damage it. And what I mean by that is as soon as you step out into the sun, just the UV light from the sun itself can actually damage your DNA. Just being alive can damage your DNA. Because of metabolism, you release reactive oxygen species. Those reactive oxygen species can then actively damage and destroy your DNA. So what your body does is it invests in a huge number of enzymes to be able to repair that DNA damage. Before I go on to talk about those enzymes, though, I think it's important to understand what DNA is. DNA is a library of instruction manuals. You imagine it as a vast library, and each one of those instruction manuals, called a gene, codes for the instructions to make a protein. Now, this library is really big. DNA is really, really long. So if you were to take the DNA from just one of my cells, that would extend to two meters, six feet. Now, if you were then to take all of the DNA from me, that's trillions of cells, 
take that end to end, that would take you from here to the sun and back 500 times. So an enormous number of, an uh, enormous length of DNA. And that DNA has to be checked constantly for damage because we can't let a single piece of damage get through because that could lead to mutation. Now, the repair process in humans is very complex. Luckily, bacteria have been on the planet much longer than us, and they've distilled the process of DNA repair down to many fewer enzymes. And so they become a really valuable model for studying DNA repair. How do they do this? Well, let's imagine that we have a small amount of DNA here, shown in this slide, and they're being exposed to UV. And a photon of UV causes some damage on the DNA, and that's shown by this star. What happens is proteins are constantly searching the DNA for damage. They find the damage, and then they signal to partners that damage has occurred here. Once they signal to the partners that the damage has occurred, the partner then takes over the damage and then triggers a cascade of repair. Now, the first thing that happens in this particular mechanism of DNA repair is that an enzyme comes along and clips the DNA either side of the damage, and then this allows that small piece of damaged DNA to be removed from the DNA. Because DNA is double-stranded, the sequence is encoded also on the second strand. So another enzyme, another mini-robot, can come in and use the sequence from the other strand to actually create a corrected strand of DNA. Now, this is a really attractive model just to look at. One might think that we've solved the problem just by looking at this animation. It's easy to make animations, but to actually create these animations is much more difficult, and that's what we do in my lab. We study single molecules. Now, just to give you an idea of uh, how many molecules there are in one litre of water, and this is just water molecules, I've calculated that it's actually 3 times 10 to 25 molecules. What that means is there's 3 with 25 zeros following it, number of molecules of water in just one litre. Now, that will make studying individual molecules very difficult. So we can study molecules within a cell. So within a bacterial cell, there can be around about 1,000 molecules of a DNA repair enzyme. But a bacterial cell has a very, very small volume. So, in fact, if you look at the volume of a bacterial cell, it is actually 15 with 14 zeros preceding it before you reach the decimal point. It's a very, very, very small volume. And what that means is when you go to study single molecules within cells, you actually find that these single molecules are very hard to distinguish. And that's what you see in this video here. So here in Kent, we've developed an approach where we can actually take a single strand of DNA. Now, a single strand of DNA is extremely thin. It takes about 30,000 strands of DNA laid next to each other to, to reach the width of a human hair. And we can take that single strand of DNA and we can put that onto platforms. And what you can see here in this um, top diagram is that we have a glass slide and on top of that glass slide we put small beads and between the beads is a single strand of DNA. And then we take proteins from bacteria and we put fluorescent labels on them, tiny fluorescent tags, so that you can see them. And in the video below, you can actually see them interacting with individual strands of DNA. So each one of those dots is a single molecule, and you could see them each expressing different behaviours. What we can do is we can study the individual behaviours of all of these molecules and start to build up a picture to create that animation. So once we have that, that will enable us to be able to answer some really fundamental questions. How, for example, is DNA damage repaired? How is it located? Remember, I, I told you that the amount of DNA in a single person runs from here to the sun and back 500 times. These enzymes need to hunt down that damage. And once we figure out how they can hunt down the damage, perhaps we can figure out ways to enhance the method by which they hunt down the damage, improving our um, processes of DNA repair, which may then actually improve our chances of dealing with diseases like cardiac disease, cancer, and aging. So hopefully, I've convinced you today that mini-robots are super cool. 
And understanding the world around us from a basic level will give us the tools to be able to deal with diseases that we know about now and diseases that are coming down in the future. And this will help us as a society. Thank you very much for listening.